This is the Demystifying Mental Toughness Podcast, hosted by David Charlton, and you're listening to this podcast to help you build your own mental toughness, or so that you can support other people or your clients better. Either way, you will learn more about developing this plastic personality trait that all but guarantees that you will perform better and lead a more prosperous life. Welcome to episode 122 of the Demystifying Mental Toughness podcast with your host, David Charlton. And today's episode is a good one. I've been trying to get this lady on the podcast for some time now, and finally, we've made it happen. Professor Camilla Knight is a world-renowned researcher in the field of sports psychology, and specifically the youth sport experience. And as a lot of our listeners will be well aware, as a company inspiring sporting excellence, We work with a large amount of youngsters across a wide variety of sports and education. And like Camilla, I'm really passionate about making sure that youngsters enjoy and get the most out of their sporting experience. Sport can be a really helpful mechanism to improve the confidence levels of youngsters, as well as their self-esteem and, of course, their mental toughness. So today, Camilla and I have a good chat about this topic. And we approach it with parents in mind. You know, parents have a very, very difficult job. And sometimes, quite often, we have to win it. So I thought this episode in particular would be very helpful for listeners who are parents. It's also for coaches and teachers, too, who are involved in the youth sport experience. I hope you go on to enjoy it as much as I did recording it. Hi, Camilla, would you be able to explain to the, the, the listeners, I know you said the viewers there, but to the listeners, um, where your interest around psychology and your, your background in sport began? Yeah, sure. So um, I guess I, I was fortunate in the fact that I grew up in a family that, that played sport. My, my dad was very good at sport and we all, from a very young age, were, were encouraged to be to be active. And, and quite early on, although not, not necessarily early in, in respect to to some of the people I was playing with or competing with, I got really interested in playing tennis um, and decided around early teenage years that tennis was where I wanted to, to focus my attention. Um, I never was going to make it as a, a pro. That was never that was never on the cards, um, not least because actually mentally I found it challenging. I, I recall quite vividly a period of time where I went on a, a winning streak of about 20 matches and nothing was better in the world than, than winning. And then they very quickly entered a 20 match losing streak or something very similar. And to this day, could probably tell you what match started that, that streak. And I think during that period, it just became really, um, I just became really conscious that actually I didn't have the skills or the strategies to know, to know what to do. And, um, you know, sports psychology was probably quite new at that time. And so I decided going forward, that was something that I wanted to, to give some attention to. So there was a very personal reason um, for getting interested in it. And then, once I did my undergrad, so I did my undergrad in sport and exercise science. Um, psychology stood out, but actually so did physiology, much to my surprise. Um, but in the end, psychology, psychology won through and I did, you went on to do my, my MSc in sports psychology and then you know, ultimately my, my PhD. So it was a very personal reason to start. Yeah. Brilliant. And obviously you've written <laughs> a crazy amount of uh, research papers around youth sport and you've, you've done an awful lot of fantastic work in that field where, where did that I suppose where did that specialty come from I just um I've just always loved youth sport you know I, I have had you know fantastic opportunities to work um as a practitioner within the elite I guess the elite space um but for me you know I really want to make a difference and, and that is in the youth space I think you know it's an opportunity to you know, work with more people, support more people, and and really just help other people to get the joy of of in, being engaged in sport. But also, I think again, linked to that that personal story that I started with, I think I'm very aware that you know, especially you know, in individual sports like the one that I played, but in in all sports, you know, if young people aren't supported, you know, they could quite quickly go off sport or not get all of the benefits that you know, uh, we know are associated with it. So it's really about recognising that I think, you know, the more we can understand the youth sport experience and the more we can support young people involved in sport, 
you know, hopefully they more, the more they can enjoy it, the more they can reach that potential, the longer they'll be involved, etc. So maybe a little idealistic, but, but that's, uh, that's the hope anyway. Yeah, and really the, that should be the key in, about your sport, shouldn't it? To, for joy, as you say, about engagement and really the, the, the taking part aspect. And obviously being competitive is in, and winning is a, is a nice addition to, <laughs> along the way. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, we, you know, I think sometimes we talk about children enjoying sport and, and talk about it very separately to competing and performing well and, you know, winning as an, an outcome. But actually, we know those things are related. And we know that, you know, for some children, they get their enjoyment from spending time with others. For some, they come, they get it from being very competitive. And, you know, for, for some people, it's about, you know, having great opportunities to, you know, interact with coaches, for instance. So I think, you know, when I use the term enjoyment, it's it's also about understanding, you know, the different sources of enjoyment people can get and, and trying to facilitate everyone to access, you know, sport in a way that's enjoyable for them. Would you say that's an important thing for, for parents to recognise is why it is that their children actually take part in the sport? Oh, absolutely. And, you know, uh, as you know, my real interest or one of the, the big areas I focus my research on has been around parents. And I've had the great pleasure to talk to hundreds of parents and hundreds of athletes, actually probably into the thousands around, you know, the youth sport experience and how parents can best support that. And, and one of the fundamental things that comes out when you talk to young people is about parents understanding why they're involved and parents also understanding that those reasons might change over time. And so while I might start off really just wanting to play and have fun with my friends, actually, if I've been training really hard and I've committed a lot of time for a performance, that performance and me going out and being able to display a good performance is the important piece of that at time. And, you know, I think, you know, the more that parents can understand those changing motives and those changing um, reasons for being involved, then, you know, the better parents will be positioned to support children. I imagine as well for the the parents just having an understanding of why it is that they want their son or their daughter involved in the sport as well. That, that's got to be an important thing because it's going to shape the way they communicate with them. Yeah, absolutely. And you touched on something really important there. And it's about actually parents understanding why they first got children into sport and children understanding what they want to get out of sport. And, you know, if parents and children are on entirely different pages, you're going to probably run into some conflict. You know, if you've got a child who's decided that they're really committed and they're really, you know, wanting to go somewhere and reach their potential, whatever that potential is, but their parents just going, oh, just go out and have fun. Don't worry about it. That can be as frustrating to the child as, you know, a child just wanting to go out and have fun and, you know, a parent potentially talking too, too much about the outcome. So making sure you're on the same page is really important. But but that does require from parents a little bit of reflection around actually why did I encourage them to be involved and, and, and recognizing that, you know, what the literature would say is that usually, typically, parents initially, initially introduce children to sport for health benefits, to be active, to make friends. But that quite quickly can start to change when you're in the competitive environment. Um, and actually just being conscious of that as a parent, that actually you're very pure for want of a better word, motives might start to shift because of the environments you're in um, and just taking time to reflect on, oh, have they changed and are they still aligned with, you know, what my child's wanting to do and have we had some conversations around this? It's really important just to, to make sure you do stay on, on the same page. Yeah, that's a really interesting one, that, because, I mean, naturally as a parent, when, you, when your child's playing a sport, your emotions are evoked and then... If over a period of time the, the child's doing well and progressing and progressing, then yeah, again, your emotions can get evoked even further. And before you know it, after a period, you've, you've lost all sight of what you've talked about. Yeah. And, you know, you know, as a parent, you, in, you invest a lot of time, a lot of money, a lot of emotion. Um, and we know that, you know, the culture of some sports, not all sports, but many, you know, competitive sports demand and require more and more and more from parents and from, from children. So I think it's natural to understand that actually, you know, the, the environment is going to shape and, and impact on what you're thinking, what you think is important, and you know, also who you're spending time with. So you're spending time with different people who maybe have different beliefs or different goals, and ultimately all of that's going to start to influence, you know, thoughts, feelings, behaviours. Mm -hmm. 
So the yeah, the self awareness piece there is is very critical as as a parent. More recently, in the in the last few years, mental health and well being is widely being researched and is it's discussed on a daily basis in in sports psychology. Um, you know, what advice would you give to to parents around that again in, in with regards to the the youth sport experience? I think that the first thing, and perhaps. I was going to say the most important, but I don't think it's the most important. I, I'd say the first thing is, you know, recognizing actually, you know, what's typical for your child. Um, I think sometimes we have an idea of, you know, what a child should be doing, how they should be acting. You know, they need to be social. They need to be doing certain things, but not all children are the same. And as a parent, you know your child best and, you know, understanding, you know, what your child's typical behaviors are is really important because then you can start to notice when behaviors maybe start to change. And then it's about having conversations. And I think it's about having open and honest conversations regularly. You know, one of the things that's very consistent in the, the research and the work that I do around parents is just how important it is to try and com- uh, communicate and to understand your child as an individual, not to get drawn into comparing them um, to, to others, but actually just to, you know, have regular conversations about how are they doing? What are they thinking? You know, how, how are things going? And, you know, that maybe sounds a little bit, bit too simple, but if you start to introduce some of those habits early on, you know, then hopefully they can continue. But also I think it's about recognizing actually, um, how early experiences within sport and obviously well being is influenced by many things outside of sport. But if we are thinking about sport, you know, specifically, you know, we don't want children to get too drawn into, you know, an exclusive athletic identity too early because we know that can impact on their well-being if things aren't going well or maybe there's a transition or maybe something's going really well and that's kind of unexpected um, as well. So I think as a parent, an important um, role that you can play as, you know, is in those early formative years of sport participation is just encouraging children to you know, engage in a range of different sports, you know, explore themselves outside of sport as well and, you know, have, you know, a multifaceted um, identity. Yeah, I suppose by getting involved in a range of sports as well as the, the psychological benefits, you've got the physical benefits as well, haven't you? The different movement patterns, they, they develop and, and can the social groups and bonds and what have you. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I am conscious that there is a lot of um, recommendations and suggestions around, you know, ensuring that children are sampling a lot of different sports and that that can come with financial and time pressures for parents. You know, so I do put the caveat in there of, you know, recognizing actually what's what's possible within your means um, as a parent, um, because, you know, yeah, great. You know, <clears throat> we could be encouraging you know a child to play a different sport every single day of the week, but actually, if you can't do that financially or because of time or commitments of other siblings, as a parent, if that's causing you stress and putting you know excessive demands on you, then that will also then subsequently you know could impact on your child as well, because we know that how you feel as a parent impacts on how you you parent your child. So I think you know there there is you know, a recognition that actually, you know, parents need to be taking care of themselves a little bit along the way. And and that's become very apparent with, with COVID and the lockdowns with, you know, talking to a lot of parents who, you know, obviously no one wanted the, the pandemic, but they quite enjoyed it for a little bit when some of those commitments and those requirements to be here, there and everywhere all of the time were taken away. And then when they all came back almost at once, their eyes were wide open going, well, how are we doing this? You know, and they hadn't realized that, you know, over time we just signed up for one club and then another club and then hours had increased and suddenly, you know, very, very scheduled. And, you know, that over scheduling obviously can have impacts on children and, you know, opportunities for rest and recovery and free play and, you know, time to just be a child outside of very adult structured activity. But it also has an impact on parents and family life and social life, you know. So I think, you know, a key thing is recognizing that you, you know, the parent-child relationship is a relationship. It's bi-directional, um, and actually, you know, if we want to give children the best experiences, we have to understand what's going on for parents and and vice versa. That's that's a fascinating point. That is, I'm, I just want to take you back first, and then we'll we'll explore that a little bit more. So you mentioned there about a little bit earlier about open and honest conversations and the importance of communication with a child. So. Here's a, here's a 
question for you. What happens if you help one of those children who just nods their heads and says yes or no all the time? And <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> I, 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 <laughs> I think it's about trying to have conversations in non-threatening situations. You know, we we know that if you sit a child down directly opposite you at a table, and you know, we're going to have a conversation, you're unlikely to, you know, get much information, but perhaps when you're driving to, to a practice or a training session or, you know, driving back from a match or something, and you're sitting side by side in a car, sometimes those conversations flow a little bit more easily. Um, and I think it's also actually around not, not trying to force the conversations. So, you know, you could plant a seed about actually down, you know, at some point, it would be great to talk to you about this. You know, let me know when that might work. Or, you know, I think we often get drawn into trying to do things on our schedules, you know, as, as the, the adult, um, you know, or the parent. And we yeah, we need to have that conversation right now. But actually, it might not be a, you know, a convenient time where your child might have other things on their mind or they want to have some time to chill out. So I think sometimes it's about, you know, plant the seed, see if anything comes up. If it doesn't, then, you know, maybe you want to, you know, reapproach it down the line. Again, unfortunately, I don't have a solution if you still get no, nothing, nothing at all. But I think it's about trying to, you know, in that situation, recognize that, you know, there is a lot going on for teenagers and it's not uncommon for that, you know, that communication to reduce. But we do know that, you know, if young people continue to be involved in sport, they tend to be more um, likely to develop quality relationships with their parents because of simply the time that you that you spend together. Yeah, and I suppose that there is a time, as as you as you've said, to have those type of conversations on the way, maybe to a a competition, an event when when there's lots of nerves and <laughs> nervous tension in the car. Maybe isn't the time on occasions. It's more no, and, and I think it's and again i am conscious i may be coming across as the, the very ideal and you know i'm not suggesting that this would be easy to do if you suddenly introduced it with a 15 year old having never never done it before but you know if you've got younger kids um having conversations relatively regularly you know every few months or so about you know what do you think when i say this or when would you like to have these types of conversations or you know in the lead up to a game would you really rather i was just quiet you know, and, and being open to your child, giving you some suggestions around how they would like you to interact can be really useful. So I think you could have a conversation around when you would like to have conversations. Um, but, but I think as a parent, we typically don't ask our child to direct how we parent. Um, you know, and obviously we did a study where we asked kids, you know, what would <laughs> what would make sport enjoyable and one of the things that the, the kids said were well once I finished playing I just want to play my Xbox all day because I've done like my activity well now of course you know parents aren't necessarily <laughs> going to endorse that so we can't always do what what children want but I think having a conversation to understand their needs and then explain to them you know how you might try and meet them or why you can't try and meet them you know is as useful as um, or more useful, sorry, than just saying, no, I'm not going to do this or not asking in the first place. Yeah, and, and those needs are going to change again as over time, depending on their yeah. age and what, what's going on. Absolutely. In terms, going back to the, the stressors that, that parents actually face as well and how that goes on to shape their experience and the child's experience, do you want to just share with the, the listeners some research that you've carried out and some further insights into that? Yeah, so that actually was my very first research that I did. So um, to, to add a little personal element to this, you know, I, I mentioned obviously as a <clears throat> as a child myself, you know, playing tennis, I ch I struggled with you know managing some of the psychological demands. But you know, it was also really tough on my family because I had very high expectations for myself, and my mood changed wildly depending on you know how I'd done and, and not and. You know, my mum found it really stressful. She found it really tough to watch me and very rarely came came to watch me. And she often jokes that it was really good when mobile phones came about because she knew if I text, I'd lost. But if I phoned, then I'd won. So she knew before she spoke to me, you know, what mood I might be and what the outcome might be. Um, so I was really interested, you know, when I first got into research of understanding what's, what's it like for parents. Um, it's tough. You know, I think, What's really apparent from a, a research perspective is that 
parents understandably the emotional bond with your child means that you are invested in how they are feeling and so as a parent being on the sidelines watching your child compete which is not something that you typically do in any other environment and not being able to step in and help is really emotionally demanding and so parents have listed and indicated a lot of stress is associated with knowing what to say knowing when to say it knowing that when the performance isn't going well, that they're going to be the one who has to pick it up, pick up all the pieces at the end. You know, so there's a big emotional stressor for, for parents, and that unsurprisingly impacts on how parents react during and after after matches. And then there's just all these organizational stressors. You know, not only the the time that you have to invest in the finance that you have to invest, but you know the impact they have. So we can't afford family holidays because the money's been invested in sport. We don't have family time because the time is split in sport. Concerns around what governing bodies are doing or clubs and coaches are doing. Perceptions around favoritism, and then on top of that, there's all these developmental stresses for parents around actually, am I making the right decisions for my child? Should I have let them miss the sleepover to go to the competition, or should they have skipped the competition to go to the sleepover? Should they be coming out of school to compete or staying in school? Um, you know, should we be going to this club or that club? And there's lots of decisions that parents feel that they have to they have to make that you know really only a parent can be making um, that, that, that do add to the, those stresses. So, you know, I think it's important to recognise that those are all on top of your kind of everyday parenting stresses. You know, the, well, I've got to get them up, get them to school, make sure they've done their homework, got a packed lunch or, you know, all of those sorts of things. Um, and then as a parent, you maybe have to get to work and do all, do, do all of that as well. So I think, you know, there are a lot of demands. And what the general parenting literature would show is that the more stress a parent is experiencing, the more likely they are to engage in punitive behaviours. Um, and I'm sure we've all experienced that if we're a parent, you know, you're a bit stressed out about something and suddenly you're shouting at your child or you're reacting in a way you wouldn't typically um, react. And it's nothing to do with what they're doing. It's actually, you know, to do with the emotions you're experiencing. So, you know, that that is tough. Now, that's not to say there's no benefits to parents, you know, so I don't want to paint as this horrendous experience that parents really shouldn't shouldn't engage in or encourage at all. You know, there's social benefits. There's opportunities to see your child um, excel. But I do think we need to to recognize that, you know, as the youth sport environment is currently set up, it does put a lot of demands on parents, which can impact on their involvement. So for parents, I suppose, again, just understanding where those stresses are coming from and how that impacts you and affects the way you communicate, the way you behave is so, so important. Yeah, and I think sometimes it's about recognizing that actually there are stresses and it's OK to say you know, there's a lot going on and there's a lot of things. And then actually spending some time thinking around, well, are there any strategies I can use to cope with these? You know, we know from some of the research that we've done that, you know, parents have access to a support network. Maybe that's within the family or other parents, you know, who can share lift, who can be a sounding board. You know, that can be really useful. We also know, you know, that actually the better able children are to cope with the demands of competitions and the emotions they experience, the easier it is for parents. So actually, as a parent, can you support either through the coach or sports psychologist or yourself as a, a parent, your child developing some skills so that maybe it's not so challenging to watch them upset or disappointed um, because they can cope with that. You know, that, that can be really useful. So I think it's one about recognizing that there are demands and there are stresses and they may impact on your behaviors and that's okay like we know that happens but then can we come up with some some strategies to, to to cope with those and i think that's really important for parents but it's also really important for coaches and clubs and organizations to go are we doing anything to support parents so that they can be more easily involved and consequently you know the young people can have better experiences yeah have you done research around that the parents who are actually coaches as well and have their, their children? Um, I actually personally haven't. And it's it's surprising that there's more limited research in that space than, than you would think. But what that research does tend to show is that it's, it's hard because as a, a parent coach, you often get perceived as displaying pa- uh, favoritism towards your child. So consequently, you adapt. And then your child might think that you're not giving them the same sort of attention. So you are a little bit of a rock and a hard place in terms of how you interact. 
Um, but it's not uncommon. Obviously, you know, a lot of parents do do coach. And I think where it works the most successfully is when there's very honest conversations with the other parents from the outset around, you know, these are the, the decisions that I'm going to make. This is how I make these decisions. Coaching with someone else can help because then you've got someone else who can, you know, help help make some of the decisions as they relate to your own child. Um, but then being really clear with your own child around, okay, you know, let's have some rules for want of a better word around when I'm coach and when I'm, you know, mum or dad. Um, and so for some people, it's been, you know, when we get in the car to go to training, then I might become coach. You know, once the session's finished and we get in the car to go home, like then I'm mum or dad, you know, and what those rules might look like might change. But I think it is important to have some conversation and, okay, how are we going to navigate these roles? Because they are, they are different. Yeah, that boundary must be uh, must be very difficult to navigate as a as that parent coach, especially if I don't know. Say you're you're coaching a team and the team's gone on a slump where they haven't won for three or four months, and that dents your ego, and yeah, it, it snowballs from there. Yeah, no, absolutely, and I think it's you know that the coaching pairs can be really useful. I think in in those situations, but I think it's also around trying to come back to you know why were you doing it in the first place. Um, you know, typically, and I know it's not in every case, but typically, you know, as a parent, you volunteer to coach because they just need a coach, you know, a club needs a coach or because you really like the sport and you want to pass on that passion and that enjoyment, etc. Um, you know, and so I think, you know, if you are having a really rough patch as a, as a coach and as a team, it's about coming back to those values around, you know, why, why did you, did you get into it? And I think, you know, for a bit of a comparison, I think a lot of parents experience the teacher parent its role during the COVID lockdowns and how tough it was to, you know, try and make your child do their their homeschooling when, you know, usually they, they you would be the one they come home to and complain about school, you know, and now suddenly you're having to try and enforce, you know, enforce some learning. So I think maybe more parents hopefully have a bit of an idea of what it might be like for parent coaches if they just replace coach with with teacher and think about some of those homeschooling experiences. <laughs> yeah, that was quite brutal, <laughs> to say the least. <laughs> Thank- thankfully, my wife's a key worker, so we packed our eldest off to school as the, <laughs> the earliest possible opportunity. <laughs> Perfect. And mine was a toddler, so um, there was nurseries were open. <laughs> Good stuff. Well, I've, look, I've really enjoyed this conversation, Camilla. I'm wondering, can you share with the, the listeners three key takeaways from what we've discussed? Yeah, I would say that the first one is um, recognizing that it's a relationship. The recognizing that, you know, the parent child interaction is bi directional and that <clears throat> the, the first thing, therefore, means that you as a parent need to take care of yourself and understand what's impacting on you because it will impact on your child. And vice versa, you know, try and understand what's impacts on your child and how that, that impacts on you. I think the, the second thing for me is around the regular conversations, you know, trying to make communication and conversation, a, you know, a standard part of, of your practice as a parent, I suppose, and not being afraid to take feedback from your child around how you are involved. And the third one is around that, um, you know, recognizing why you're all doing it really you know, thinking about why were we doing youth sport in the first place? You know, if you were impacted by COVID, how did life change when you couldn't do it? Um, You know, and what were you looking forward to to getting back to as a a parent or as a child um, when sport did open up again? Fantastic, that is. Whereabouts can the listeners um, find you or reach out to you if they want to have a conversation? I am always, always happy to have conversations around this and that the easiest place for people to, to contact me is through my university email address. So that's c.j.knight at swansea.ac.uk. Um, if there's a desire for additional resources, I have um, a website which I developed with some other sports psychology academics called sportparent.eu, which has a host of different videos and little uh, PDF leaflets, etc., which which may be of interest as well. Fantastic. I'll I'll make sure all of those details go on the show notes. And yeah, I really appreciate your time. Thank you. That's great. Thank you for having me. I really enjoyed recording this episode and sincerely hope that you took away some helpful bits of advice. One of the big points that I noted down was the importance of communication with your children. It's very easy to get drawn into being over-reliant on technology these days. 
both as a parent and as a child. And then the quality of our conversations can be diluted. We've all been there, I'm sure. When your child asks you something and you're scrolling your phone on Facebook and you go on to nod your head, ignore them potentially, or simply tell them to hang on and wait a minute or two. And then on the other side, they'll be on the iPad and you're asking them something. And what you say just doesn't register with them at all. So on that note, I'd like to encourage you to consider how and when conversations take place. And if technology does get in the way on occasions. And also in the way that you communicate as a parent, you might want to consider an empowering approach. And why? Well, by empowering children, by giving your children a voice, it can have a big impact on their confidence levels and their self-esteem, which goes on to enable children to feel happier and more comfortable with who they are, as well as trying new things. It's also likely to develop a more resilient and, of course, a mentally tough child. And what's that going to look like? Well, they're more likely to follow through with their promises or goals if they're in charge too. They're also likely to become better learners and not simply repeat mistakes. So if you like what you've heard today, you know, feel free to join the Sports Psychology Hub. It's a Facebook group which I've set up. There's lots of helpful bits of advice and also the opportunity in there to, to learn from others. And you can reach out to me too directly if you wish. Enjoy the rest of your day and your week. If you enjoyed this episode of the Demystifying Mental Toughness podcast with David Charlton, do check out my website, sport-excellence.co.uk and my online sports psychology resources. Sport Hyphen Excellence website has essential resources for anyone looking to build their own mental toughness or the mental toughness of their athletes or teams, or if you want to achieve peak performance more often or optimal functioning. The Sport Excellence website has everything you need to keep moving forward and thrive. So go on, head over to sport-excellence.co.uk to find out more.